June 9th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10 from the Old Testament. Now Elisha the prophet summoned a member of the prophetic guild and told him, Tuck your robes into your belt, take this container of olive oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshai, and take him aside into an inner room. Take the container of olive oil, pour it over his head, and say, This is what the Lord says. I have designated you as king over Israel. Then open the door and run away quickly. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, the officers of the army were sitting there. So he said, I have a message for you, O officer. Jehu asked, For which one of us? He replied, For you, O officer. So Jehu got up and went inside. Then the prophet poured the olive oil on his head and said to him, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I have designated you as king over the Lord's people, Israel. You will destroy the family of your master Ahab. I will get revenge against Jezebel for the shed blood of my servants, the prophets, and for the shed blood of all the Lord's servants. Ahab's entire family will die. I will cut off every last male belonging to Ahab in Israel, including even the weak and incapacitated. I will make Ahab's dynasty like those of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and Baasha, son of Ahijah. Dogs will devour Jezebel on the plot of ground in Jezreel. She will not be buried. Then he opened the door and ran away. When Jehu rejoined his master's servants, they asked him, Is everything all right? Why did this madman visit you? He replied, Ah, it's not important. You know what kind of man he is and the kinds of things he says. But they said, You're lying. Tell us what he said. So he told them what he had said. He also related how he had said, This is what the Lord says. I have designated you as king over Israel. Each of them quickly took off his cloak, and they spread them out at Jehu's feet on the steps. The trumpet was blown, and they shouted, Jehu is king. Then Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshai, conspired against Joram. Now Joram had been in Ramoth Gilead with the whole Israelite army, guarding against an invasion by King Hazael of Syria. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds he received from the Syrians when he fought against King Hazael of Syria. Jehu told his supporters, If you really want me to be king, Then don't let anyone escape from the city to go and warn Jezreel. Jehu drove his chariot to Jezreel, for Joram was recuperating there. Now King Ahaziah of Judah had come down to visit Joram. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel and saw Jehu's troops approaching. He said, I see troops. Jehoram ordered, Send a rider out to meet them and have them ask, Is everything all right? So the horseman went to meet him and said, This is what the king says. Is everything all right? Jehu replied, None of your business. Follow me. The watchman reported, The messenger reached them, but hasn't started back. So he sent a second horseman out to them, and he said, This is what the king says. Is everything all right? Jehu replied, None of your business. Follow me. The watchman reported he reached them, but hasn't started back. The one who drives the lead chariot drives like Jehu, son of Nimshai. He drives recklessly. Jehoram ordered, Hitch up my chariot. When his chariot had been hitched up, King Jehoram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah went out in their respective chariots to meet Jehu. They met up with him in the plot of land that had once belonged to Naboth of Jezreel. When Jehoram saw Jehu, he asked, Is everything all right, Jehu? He replied, How can everything be all right as long as your mother, Jezebel, promotes idolatry and pagan practices? Jehoram turned his chariot around and took off. He said to Ahaziah, It's a trap, Ahaziah. Jehu aimed his bow and shot an arrow right between Jehoram's shoulders. 
The arrow went through his heart, and he fell to his knees in his chariot. Jehu ordered his officer Bidkar, pick him up and throw him into the part of the field that once belonged to Naboth of Jezreel. Remember, you and I were riding together behind his father Ahab when the Lord pronounced this judgment on him. Know for sure that I saw the shed blood of Naboth and his sons yesterday, says the Lord, and that I will give you what you deserve right here in this plot of land, says the Lord. So now pick him up and throw him into this plot of land, just as the Lord said. When King Ahaziah of Judah saw what happened, he took off up the road to Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him and ordered, shoot him too. They shot him while he was driving his chariot up the ascent of Gur near Iblium. He fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants took his body back to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his ancestors in the city of David. Ahaziah had become king over Judah in the eleventh year of Joram, son of Ahab. Jehu approached Jezreel. When Jezebel heard the news, she put on some eyeliner, fixed up her hair, and leaned out the window. When Jehu came through the gate, she said, Is everything all right, Zimri, murderer of his master? He looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and when she hit the ground, her blood splattered against the wall and the horses, and Jehu drove his chariot over her. He went inside and had a meal. Then he said, Dispose of this accursed woman's corpse. Bury her, for after all, she was a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found nothing left but the skull, feet, and palms of the hands. When they went back and told him, he said, The Lord's word through his servant, Elijah the Tishbite, has come to pass. He warned, In the plot of land at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's corpse will be like manure on the surface of the ground in the plot of land at Jezreel. People will not be able to even recognize her. Ahab had 70 sons living in Samaria. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the leading officials of Jezreel and to the guardians of Ahab's dynasty. This is what the letter said. You have with you the sons of your master, chariots and horses, a fortified city and weapons. So when this letter arrives, pick the best and most capable of your master's sons, place him on his father's throne and defend your master's dynasty. They were absolutely terrified and said, look, two kings could not stop him. How can we? So the palace supervisor, the city commissioner, the leaders, and the guardians sent this message to Jehu. We are your subjects. Whatever you say, we will do. We will not make any one king do what you consider proper. He wrote them a second letter saying, If you really are on my side and are willing to obey me, then take the heads of your master's sons and come to me in Jezreel at this time tomorrow. Now the king had seventy sons, and the prominent men of the city were raising them. When they received the letter, they seized the king's sons and executed all seventy of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to him in Jezreel. The messenger came and told Jehu, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. Jehu said, Stack them in two piles at the entrance of the city gate until morning. In the morning he went out and stood there. Then he said to all the people, You are innocent. I conspired against my master and killed him. But who struck down all of these men? Therefore take note that not one of the judgments the Lord announced against Ahab's dynasty has failed to materialize. The Lord had done what he announced through his servant Elijah. Then Jehu killed all who were left of Ahab's family and Jezreel and all his nobles, close friends, and priests. He left no survivors. Jehu then left there and set out for Samaria. While he was traveling through Beth Echid of the shepherds, Jehu encountered the relatives of King Ahaziah of Judah. He asked, Who are you? They replied, We are Ahaziah's relatives. We have come down to see how the king's sons and the queen's mother's sons are doing. 
he said, capture them alive. So they captured them alive and then executed all 42 of them in the cistern at Beth Echid. He left no survivors. When he left there, he met Jehonadab, son of Rechab, who had been looking for him. Jehu greeted him and asked, Are you as committed to me as I am to you? Jehonadab answered, I am. Jehu replied, If so, give me your hand. So he offered his hand, and Jehu pulled him up into the chariot. Jehu said, Come with me and see how zealous I am for the Lord's cause. So he took him along in his chariot. He went to Samaria and exterminated all the members of Ahab's family who were still alive in Samaria, just as the Lord had announced to Elijah. Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab worshipped Baal a little. Jehu will worship him with great devotion. So now bring to me all the prophets of Baal, as well as all his servants and priests. None of them must be absent, for I am offering a great sacrifice to Baal. Any of them who fail to appear will lose their lives. But Jehu was tricking them so he could destroy the servants of Baal. Then Jehu ordered, Make arrangements for a celebration for Baal. So they announced it. Jehu sent invitations throughout Israel, and all the servants of Baal came. Not one was absent. They arrived at the temple of Baal and filled it up from end to end. Jehu ordered the one who was in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out robes for all the servants of Baal. So he brought out robes for them. Then Jehu and Jehonadab, son of Rechab, went to the temple of Baal. Jehu said to the servants of Baal, Make sure there are no servants of the Lord here with you. There must be only servants of Baal. They went inside to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed 80 men outside. He had told them, If any of the men inside get away, you will pay with your lives. When he finished offering the burnt sacrifice, Jehu ordered the royal guard and officers, Come in and strike them down. Don't let any escape. So the royal guard and officers struck them down with the sword and left their bodies lying there. Then they entered the inner sanctuary of the Temple of Baal. They hauled out the sacred pillar of the Temple of Baal and burnt it. They demolished the sacred pillar of Baal and the Temple of Baal. It is used as a latrine to this very day. So Jehu eradicated Baal worship from Israel. However, Jehu did not repudiate the sins which Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had encouraged Israel to commit. The golden calves remained in Bethel and Dan. The Lord said to Jehu, You have done well. You have accomplished my will and carried out my wishes with regard to Ahab's dynasty. Therefore, four generations of your descendants will rule over Israel. But Jehu did not carefully and wholeheartedly obey the law of the Lord God of Israel. He did not repudiate the sins which Jeroboam had encouraged Israel to commit. In those days, the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel's territory. Hazael attacked their eastern border. He conquered all the land of Gilead, including the territory of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, extending all the way from the Aurora in the Arden Valley through Gilead to Bashan. The rest of the events of Jehu's reign, including all his accomplishments and successes, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Israel. Jehu passed away and was buried in Samaria. His son, Jehoahaz, replaced him as king. Jehu reigned over Israel for 28 years in Samaria. God, that part where Jehu uh, surrounds all the Baal uh, worshippers, whatever you call them, and then slaughters all of them. That is crazy. That is like something out of Hollywood. That's kind of amazing. I think a lot of times when I talk to people who really aren't super familiar with the Bible, they're more familiar with hand-picking stories out of the Bible. Um, this is but one of many that they bring up about how God just goes in and kills all these people, but then he says you can't murder, and and so the Bible's not true because it contradicts itself, and 
I think people need to understand why you are eradicating all these people who consistently consistently and constantly turned away from you and were worshiping all of these other gods. You had been really clear and really specific about there will be one God and it will be me because I am the one who made you. I'm the one who brought you here. And now all these people had turned, their hearts and minds had turned away from from you and turned to all the worshiping of honestly pieces of wood and and bronze and and gold because obviously those gods don't even exist I see that in our own lives I see that especially in my life that as I bring in or bring back <laughs> gods in my life whether that's uh, distraction of entertainment TV and movies um, whether that is lustful thinking, whether or and or actions, uh, whether that is pursuit of what I want over what you want, I notice that you come in. You let me stew in it for a while to see if I can figure out on my own to get out of it. Uh, and I'm sure there's some pretty obvious hints along the way. Uh, but I've also seen you come in and completely destroy, completely slaughter that part of my life. You know, sometimes it's removing people physically from, from my life. Sometimes it's removing situations or changing them so I, that I don't get to participate anymore. And I always kind of laugh a little because I so selfishly and arrogantly and uh, materialistically wanted what I wanted that I was dead set on getting it. And, and when you put those roadblocks in my life, uh, now, at least I know to pay attention to them. Now, I, it's almost like a realization to wake up. It's a mirror in front of my life. And, and I do appreciate those. But God, I just want to not even have to get to the point where you're having to throw roadblocks up in my life to keep me from sinning. I, I want you to stop having to slaughter my idols. I want them to not even be there in the first place. So God, today, I, I sincerely just pray that you will completely show me all my idols some of them I know some of them may be in my life and I haven't even recognized them yet so first and foremost just be really transparent with me and show me the idols that are in my life and then second I just pray to you that you will help me have the strength to eradicate them myself to slaughter them myself out of my life so that my whole heart my whole mind my all of my actions my whole life can just be for worshiping you. That is what brings me the most joy. That's where I resonate. That's what I was made for. And it's definitely where I would prefer to be. I don't know how my ego seems to deny me that, thinking I want something else. Uh, but I definitely want my life to be clean of any other gods. I want you to be my only God in this world. In your son's name I pray, amen.